All right. Um, this is going to be a redo of my lecture. Hopefully, this will be better than the original lecture in the sense that having heard some of the questions that were asked, I can um, answer them more smoothly in the context of the talk. So what are the odds? <clears throat> This was a question that was asked on Cross Validated, which is a very nice site in which people get to ask questions about statistics. OP stands for original poser. And he asked, he said, I have the data of 100 flips of a coin. And I get 100, out of the 100 flips, I got 80 heads, oops, and 20 tails. The probability of this happening is this funny looking symbol. This is read as 100 choose 80 and then 0.5 to the 100th power, which is really small. So can I conclude the coin is biased, yes or no? Well, quick aside, what does that mean? This works equally well for anything. It's not particular to coin flips. But let's just pretend we're talking about coin flips. It's the same. Uh, if a heads has a occurrence of probability of P, then uh, tails would be 1 minus p. So if p equals 0.5, you have a fair coin, but there's no reason. And for example, you might be talking about the probability of picking red balls out of an urn with a replacement, and red balls are 2 thirds of them, in which case p would be uh, 2 over 3. Uh, so you can ask, though, whatever, what are the odds of getting k heads in n flips? And it's a very fancy piece of mathematics called the binomial theorem that says the answer is n choose k times p to the k times 1 minus p to the n minus k. Now, n choose k, by the way, is just simply the number of ways you can pick out of n things k of them. So for example, if you were talking um, about coin flips, and let's say you wanted to uh, take, you say, how many ways could I get uh, two heads out of four flips? Well. There are six. Four choose two turns out to be six. And in this case, you could simply enumerate it. You can have heads on the first one, and then on the second one, first and third, first and fourth, that's three. You can have heads on the second, and then on the third, and then on the fourth, that's two more, that's five. And then you could have heads on the third and fourth, that's six. But n choose k is just the number of different ways. And it turns out that this is the answer. So if a coin is fair, p and 1 minus p are both 0.5, and the formula becomes n choose k times 0.5 to the nth power, because p and 1 minus p are the same number. That's the number of heads. So in particular, 100 choose 80 times 0.5 to the 100th power is the number of wave, is the probability of getting 80 heads if you flip a coin 100 times. This is small. Just skipping ahead, you can do this in R, the way you do the uh, 100 choose 80 is the R function is called choose. So choose 100 comma 80 times 0.5 to the 100th power. And we get uh, something that has nine zeros and then a four. So that's very, very small. Uh, the first quiz was just a, a quick quiz on <clears throat> what are the odds using this. So I throw four fair coins. What are the odds I will get all heads or all tails? Now, the hint was any particular sequence of heads or tails has probability of 1 over 16, because there's a half occurrence of it getting a head or a tail on any, either any flip. So if you want to flip four heads, it's a half times a half times a half times a half, which is 1 over 2 to the fourth, which is 1 16th. And the four answers were small, under 10%, 1 over 16, 3 to 1, or 1 eighth. And the correct answer is 1 8th, because as I just said, the odds of getting um, all heads is 1 16th, and the odds of getting all tails is also 1 16th. So you add them together and you get 1 8th. And as I said, the odds of getting uh, exactly 80 heads out of 100 flips is extremely small. So you might conclude on that basis that it's very unlikely the coin is fair. However, what about if you want to get 50 heads and 50 tails? You can use the same formula. Now you still have 100 flips, but you want 50 of them to be heads. So the formula is choose 100 comma 50 times 0.5 to the 100th power. And you still get slightly under 8%, which is very small, and is not in keeping with our understanding that if you've got 50 heads and 50 tails, 
that would be pretty good evidence that the coin you that was flipped was fair. So this really starts saying, what's the right question to ask? Right? If you want to say if, if a coin flips are fair or not, <clears throat> you have to have a, a question that you can answer. And remember last week we started talking about statistical testing, and this is what you do. You're going to do statistical testing. You're going to have a hypothesis that the coin is fair, and you're going to say, what are the odds that if the coin is fair, you would observe this behavior? But as in statistical testing, since any uh, particular observation is unusual, the real question you want to ask is, what are the odds of getting a role that is at least as unusual as the observed role? So what you can ask is, what are the odds of getting a role that is at least as unusual as the observed role? Or more specifically, what are the odds, if you have a fair coin, that you'll get at least 80 heads? Okay. That's in some sense what we could think, but certainly if getting 80 heads is going to be a reasonable outcome, getting 80 or more heads is not going to affect that. So that's the right answer. The correct answer is, and oh, I guess in the quiz I wanted to point out, if you ask what are the odds of getting 80 or more heads out of 100 rolls, that's the same thing in some sense as asking what are the odds of getting less than 80 heads out of 100 rolls. Why? Because if the probability of getting 80 heads is something, 80 or more heads, then the probability of getting less than 80 heads is 1 minus something. Right. So the question is, since the first two choices tell us the first thing, we really just need to figure out what are the odds of getting 80 or more heads and then judge if this is reasonable. Is it likely? If your coin is really fair, if it's really a 50-50 flip at, at, um, at each time, is it reasonable, is it probable that you'll get 80 or more heads when you flip the coin 100 times? And how do we answer that? We answer that with something called the chi-squared statistic, chi. So what the statistic is going to do is it's going to give us a number that's going to give us an idea of how unusual our actual answer is. So so we have the two counts. We would expect to get 50-50, and in fact, we have 80-20. We want to measure how far off 80-20 is from 50-50. And the chi-squared is such a number. And it has good statistical properties. So first of all, let me just tell you how chi-squared is calculated. You take, and, and the point is, is this is more general than just two coin flips, but if you have any number of observations, you can look at your observations minus what you'd expect, and expect means what you would have if the, the average or the mean if, if it was actually um, unbiased. Oops. So in the case of coin flips, the expected value of any flip is um, 0.5. So whether you observe a head or a tails, you'd um, get 0.5 for the expected value. But of course, if you're doing more than one, you do them. So you know if you have four flips, you would expect to get two heads. So whether you observe three or uh, one, you'd expect to have two heads and four flips. So you look at these differences. So this is um, O minus E quantity squared is a measure of how far what you're observing comes from what you'd expect to observe. And then you divide by what you expect to observe. And the point of this is this normalizes for the expectation. In other words, how far the observed is from the expected is a function of what you're expected. If you're expecting 252 and you get 250, the difference is 2, that's not so bad. If you're expecting 0 and you get 2, that's pretty large. Now, of course, you can't have an expected value of 0. I'm sorry. Uh, so as I say, O is the observed frequency and E is the expected frequency. In the case of a coin, you expect half the flips to be heads and half the flips to be tails. So you expect 50 heads and 50 tails. You observe 80 heads and 20 tails. And the hypothesis is that the two counts are independent and that the expected is going to be calculated by something called marginal distributions and is the product. I will explain that in greater detail later. But the point is, is this chi-squared is a measure of how far what you observe 
is from what you actually expect. And remember, we're talking about samples of counts. It could be coins. It could be how many people you expect to go to a theater in the morning or in the afternoon. You might say, I think more people go to the theater in the afternoon. And you would look at counts of people going to the same movie in the morning and the same movie in the afternoon, and you would use a chi-squared statistic. Uh, you might, in the, one, the example we will see later on, is cancer. Uh, this is a very famous old study where people looked at people who were in the hospital for lung cancer and people who were in the hospital not for lung cancer and they compared the number of people who uh, smoked and they compared over different intervals of different numbers of cigarettes smoked and they looked, used that to determine that people who smoked a lot seemed to be more likely to get cancer. There was a connection. I will discuss that in more detail. But this chi-squared you should think of as a number that measures how far what you're observing is from what you'd expect to observe given your hypothesis. Okay. Um, I want to say one thing. Given the, the, the observed values are going to be integers, that counts. The expected values don't have to be. They're just hypothetical. If you throw a fair coin five times, you expect to get two and a half heads. You expect to get two and a half tails. Right? Obviously, you can't get a coin, five, flip a coin five times and get two and a half. Uh, you can get three or you can get two, but you can't get two and a half. And um, so it makes some sense that looking at this formula, that this difference between observed is a random variable because there's noise in it, and the expected is a mean value. This is some sort of normal variable, and this E is a normalization factor, so it's kind of plausible basis that, that you could believe that every one of these terms is some sort of a square of a normal random variable normalized, okay? And in fact, chi-squared is that. So you can calculate these things well. Um, and that's that. So we expect chi-squared to look like a sum of squares of random variables. And it is, and that's how we can calculate it. So incidentally, there's a function called p chi squared, which allows us to calculate these values. I just want to go a little bit further, and then I'll explain this to you in more detail. Um, so let's do another example with coin flips. Again, the situation is we want to know if a coin is fair. But instead of just flipping it a, a, some reason a certain number of times, we flip it twice and we count how many we get either heads, 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 tails, or tails, tails. Notice if you get heads and the tails, you're twice as likely because you can either get heads, tail, or tails, heads. Okay? So you expect there's a 25% chance of getting heads, heads, 50% chance of getting a head and a tail, and a 25% chance of getting a tails and a tail. So if we do this 500 times, we expect to see 125 times we're going to see two heads. 250 times we're going to see a heads and a tail, and 125 times we expect to see two tails. Suppose we observe that we get 106 heads, two heads, 252 times we observe a head and a tail, and 142 times we observe two tails. Is that likely? The question is, is it likely that this is a fair coin? So we want to test the hypothesis that our coin is fair. And the hypothesis is that it is probable to see this piece of data when you have this as your expected value. Now, with two coins, heads and tails, it was very simple to understand what you mean by the distance. You have 80 minus 50 and 20 minus 50. This starts getting a little more complicated. But the chi-square statistic is exactly going to give you a statistically justified measure of how far away this observation is from the expected observation, okay? So the chi-squared will give you a measure of how far it is. You can calculate that value, and then you can calculate via this, excuse me, this p chi-squared, probability of chi-squared, the probability of getting that value, okay? So we're going to set it up as a hypothesis test, and what we're going to ask is what's the probability of observing a role at least as extreme as that, given that we have a fair coin. Now, let's take a brief sidelight to look at chi-squared. Uh, 
Okay, this is not a chi-square distribution. This is a normal distribution. Now, this is a normalized, so this is this red thing is a normal distribution of um uh let's see, what is it? Yes, yeah, a standard normal distribution. It has mean zero, that much is obvious, and it has standard deviation one. Now remember, if you count a z-score, you can calculate the probability of getting a value of that z-score or less. So for example, if your piece, if your z-score is zero, this corresponding to this value, of course this curve is symmetric, so the probability of getting a, a z-score of zero or less is 50%. 50% of the values of the distribution are less than zero, 50% of the people have, a, have, a, excuse me, have a, um, 50% of the z-scores have a value bigger than zero. And you might recall that on this, uh, we look at 1.96 and we say, we say that 96% of the data is within two standard deviations of the mean. What does that mean? It means that if, if you look at P of, P of 1.96, 90, well, in fact, it means 97.5% of the data is there to the left because it's a two-sided test, because what that means is then if 2.5% uh, of the data is bigger than two standard deviations, then 2.5% of the data is less than two standard deviations, and you this middle thing between 1.96 and negative 1.96 is 95% of the data. And we can uh, calculate that. We, we know how to do, if we go P norm 1.96, we get 97.5. So 97.5% of the data is to the left of that. And that's because we know how to compute areas under this normal distribution, and we have the interpretation that if we have some value, a z-score of this, then the area under the curve to the left of there is the probability of getting a z-score of that value or lower. This is what a chi-square distribution looks like. Remember, your expected value, if things were exactly as expected, you would get a, a chi-squared of zero, right? Let me go back. If you got exactly what was expected, that would mean O was equal to E, and that this number was zero. You'd be summing up a bunch of zeros, and you would have zero. So the most likely value you'd like to leave is zero. And the value of the chi-square, the p-chi-square, is the area to the left. So if you got a, a, a chi-squared value of 2.5 in this, the area to the left of uh, 2.5, this would be the probability of getting a p-chi-square of 2.5 or less. All right? Back to what are the odds. So we want to set up this hypothesis that our coin is fair, and we want to understand what is the probability of getting a roll that extreme, and the way we're going to measure that extreme is by chi-squared. So we're going to calculate what a chi-squared is for that, for this uh, data, and we're going to say what's the probability of getting a chi-squared value that big or bigger. And if that number, the probability of getting that is greater than 5%, it falls within the 95% confidence interval, and we're going to accept it. If it doesn't, if the value, the probability of getting a chi-squared with corresponding this is 5% or less, we're going to reject the hypothesis. How do we do this? Well, I'm going to create a matrix called chi-coin, and it's just going to have 125, 250, 125, 106, 252, 142, and the number of rows equals 3. And remember, R wants to go down rows and then go back. So this is going to be 125, 250, 125, just like this. It's going to put the first three numbers in the first row, the second three numbers in the second, uh, in the second column. First three numbers in the first column, okay? It's not going to go across. It's going to go down like that. No problem. I'm going to create another, uh, excuse me, another matrix called um, CalcCoin which is also going to have three rows and two columns. That's where I'm going to put my calculations. And this uh, is where I named it. Uh, you can 
stop and uh, look at this more carefully, but I just give the column names to the chi coin expected observed, expected minus observed squared, and expected minus observed squared over E. So right now there's blanks here. I can get the actual values by saying the third column, that's this E minus O squared. Well, E minus O is the first minus the second squared, or the second minus the first squared. So I can get this third value by just taking column two minus column one quantity squared. And then the fourth column takes the third column and divides by the first column. So it's just the third column divided by the first column. And that's going to be the that, and this is what I get. Now the chi squared is just going to be the sum of those. So the chi squared value is gotten by adding all four of those columns. And we can calculate this by via p chi squared. Now the one important thing is um, <clears throat> something called degrees of freedom. Now what this means is that you don't get to arbitrarily put all these numbers. Given that you have this kind of table, you don't actually get to put all the numbers in freely. If you're going to have this correct ratios, it can't be. You may remember that when you take the mean of n numbers, you divide by n, but then when you take the standard deviation, instead of dividing by n, you divide by n minus 1. That's because you already have the n minus 1 is n minus the degrees of freedom. You give up one degree of freedom because if I have n minus 1 observations and the mean, algebraically I can calculate the last one. And similarly, for um, reasons that have to do with uh, ranks and matrices and determinants, actually, uh, you can say that um, the number of ops, you, you can actually, there's a bunch of algebraic equations these observations have to satisfy if these columns are independent of each other, and you can calculate that it's the number of rows minus one times the number of columns minus one. Okay, so in other words, you really can only have that many independent variables. The rest are forced on you by algebra. You can solve for the rest of them algebraically if under your hypothesis that they're independent. Uh, so in our case we had three rows and two columns. Three minus one is two. Two minus one is two. So there are two degrees of freedom. Okay? So all you have to really I believe in is that the degrees of freedom is the number of rows minus one times the number of columns minus one. So the value of p chi squared is the probability of getting a value less than the observed value. Uh, and what did we say that was? Uh, where was it? I didn't give it yet. So 1 minus this p chi squared value is the probability of observing a value that large or larger. So the sum of the all these of those fourth columns is 5.216. So we want to calculate p chi squared for 5.2 with two degrees of freedom. And we get that the value is 92.63, so roughly 93. So roughly there's a 93% chance that you get about a a chi-squared value of 5.2 or smaller. What does that mean? It means there's roughly a 7% chance that you get a value of 5.2 or larger. And in fact, 1 minus p squared squared is 7.3. So we get that there's a 7% chance of observing that data if the coin was fair. Now, according to our hypothesis, 0.07 is fine because we're looking at the 5% level of significance. In other words, we're going to reject the hypothesis if the probability is under 5%. So basis this, since there's a 7% probability that the coin is fair, we're going to accept the hypothesis that the coin is fair. Right? Now, let's just be very clear as to what statement is we've made. What we've said is, basis the data we have, we don't have enough evidence at the 5% level to reject the null hypothesis that the coin is fair, that the sample we saw was a sample from a, a, a fair coin. But more data could change that. So 
what I've done here is I've said suppose instead of drawing the coin 500 times you drew it 50,000 times but you had the exact same ratio of heads and tails so in other words I create the matrix 125 250 125 106 252 142 and multiply it by 100 now I have I would expect to see 12,500 double heads and I saw 10,600 okay I can do the exact same thing all right all I've done is I've created the matrix I've calculated this as uh, the, the individual components of the chi squared and I last the chi value is the sum of all the fourth column and I say if I, with this new thing what's the probability with this new chi value and it's, it's just going to be you know some multiple what's the probability of getting a value that big or smaller it's one which means that the probability of getting a value that big or larger getting a chi square value that big or bigger is zero now in case you're curious the point is is I said there was a seven percent chance of that data of you getting that data so in essence what you're really doing is saying well if there's a seven percent chance of doing it if I do this sample ten times right let alone a hundred times already after 10 times if there's a 7% chance this was right to do it 10 times in a row they'd have to be 7 to the 10th which is essentially zero already let alone if you did it a hundred times so in other words while this since this data is is plausible but not particularly likely if you got this number and did the same experiment a hundred times and each time gave, got the same number it would now be highly unlikely you, you would go from a seven percent chance that this was a fair coin to essentially a zero percent chance is a fair coin and um, this is because as you have more data the, 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 the just the central limit for theorem is that while data distribution may not be normal means of them are so averages of them are and this is what this is an average okay so to summarize what have we done? I've said that if you want to, if you have counts of data and you want to understand whether two different counts of data come from the same distribution, right? You want to find something to measure how far from what you'd expect if they were measured, if they really came from the same distribution. And the way we measure that is something called chi squared. So we created a chi-squared statistic, which you can calculate, and you can calculate with R. Using chi-squared, you can test the hypothesis that your two sets of counts are the same, came from the same distribution. Now, in the case of coins, one of them was a fair coin. You know it's 50-50 heads, tails, and then you had another dis you know, distribution. So you, can, you were testing the probability that the distribution you saw of coins came from a fair coin toss, sequence of fair co coin tosses. Um, and the chi-squared is a number that measures that difference and it has good statistical properties and in particular you can calculate it and R has functions to calculate it. So we can observe the probability of uh, getting a chi-squared value that big or bigger. All right now I want to give one more example and this is cancer data and this is a very old very famous study uh, they went to a hospital and they found how many people were cancer patients they counted the number of cancer patients and then they looked at people who smoked um, and all the cancer patients smoked and they um, counted how many people who smoked were in for other diseases so cancer patients are people who are in for cancer and the control group are people in the hospital for other reasons and this tells you how many cigarettes they smoke so of the people who smoked one to four cigarettes 33 were in for cancer 55 were in for other things and the people's it's chart has gotten a little off but of the people who smoke 15 to 24 cigarettes 196 are uh, were in for cancer and 190 were in for other diseases and I put the data in by just um, doing this way and I notice there's a new command here and by the way this is discussed in the book in uh, Kind's book by row equals true as I said 
R wants to go like this and then fill in this and fill in this and then fill in this and then fill in this. If you, that's by row equals false. If you say by row equals true, it'll fill them in across a row first. And we see 33, 250, 196, 33, 250, 196. So I just created a, a matrix to contain the data and I gave the columns and the rows names. Uh, and we want to see if this data can give some evidence. Now, what would it mean if there was no difference. So the hypothesis you're going to test is that there's no difference between people getting cancer or not getting cancer based on how many cigarettes you smoke. Now just going ahead to the bar plot, oops, the bar plot's down here, we see that sort of visually, if not statistically, visually this doesn't seem to be true. As the number of cigarettes smoke up, the number of people who are in for cancer as opposed to other diseases starts increasing. The small cigarettes, it doesn't seem to be any connection. 5 to 14, again, there's more people in for other diseases. When you get to 15 to 24, all of a sudden, the number of people in for cancer is slightly bigger than the number of people not in for cancer. And when you go to 25 cigarettes to 49 and 50 or more, all of a sudden, much significantly more people are in because of cancer for other things. So visually, there, there seems to be no evidence. So what do you want to do? You want to test the hypothesis. The only thing we can do is test the hypothesis that um, people who come into the cancer, come into the hospital for cancer, has nothing to do with the cigarette smoking. So the hypothesis is that whether you have cancer or some other disease is independent of how many cigarettes you smoke. So in other words, it would say that in all these things, it should be the same proportion. And more importantly, it should say that whether you came in for cancer or for something else had really nothing to do with whether you smoked. So in all these groups, um, whether you had cancer or some other disease was independent of that, and it should be independent of how many cigarettes. You would expect to see, if, if cigarette smoking had nothing to do with it, you would expect to see that the ratio 33 to 55 is approximately the same as 32 to 13. But the evidence certainly doesn't see that, and the chi-squared test is going to bear that out. So what would the chi-squared test see? We're going to test the hypothesis that cigarette smoking is independent of, um, cigarette smoking is independent of whether you get cancer or not. And what we're going to do is we want to do this by comparing these two counts and saying, are they the same? If cigarette smoking was really independent of cancer, how far are these two counts from each other? And the way we're going to measure how far these two counts are from each other is the chi-squared. So the question, does smoking increase the chance of cancer? And the data is patients who smoked and whether they're in the hospital for cancer or other diseases. If smoking isn't related to cancer, then across different smoking groups, we'd expect the ratios to be about the same for whether people have cancer or not cancer. And this is a very important point. If they are related, if we reject our hypothesis, oops, we have shown correlation, not cause. There is no way this study can prove that smoking causes cancer. For all we know, cancer causes smoking. People who um, are likely to get cancer have a gene that says smoking makes, is just the most wonderful thing in the universe. We don't know. Okay. So the quiz I asked at the time was, which group provides the strongest evidence that there is a link between smoking and cancer? As previously discussed, it's these last two groups. Looking at the bar charts, it looks like the in the 50 cigarettes or plus, you have the biggest ratio of uh, cancer to non-cancer. On the other hand, the 25 to 49, while perhaps not quite as big, is also very large, and you have more data. So you could reasonably answer either of these or both of these. Okay? So to compute the chi-squared as before, what will we do? Well, first of all, let me uh, tell you about a wonderful function in R called apply. What apply does is it allows you to do something to a bunch of rows. So I want to know how many people smoked one to four cigarettes, how many people smoked five to 14, da da da, up to how many people smoked 50 or more cigarettes. I have to add these to all the numbers in this column. Or I might want to know how many people had cancer. That means I'd have to add all the numbers in this row. 
how many people didn't have cancer, I'd have to add all the numbers in this row. The apply function allows you to apply a function to either rows or columns. So the first thing you do is you tell apply, I want to apply to cancer data set. One says rows and then I want to sum. So this is going to sum the first row and the second row and it's going to tell me there were 647 patients with cancer and 622 without. If I apply cancer uh, to two, that's going to sum all the rows. And this is going to tell me there were 88 people who smoked one to four cigarettes, 543 who smoked five to 14, and up to there were 45 people who smoked 50 or more. And of course, there were 1,269 people. Now, if the data was really independent, if smoking had nothing to do with why you were in the hospital, you could recalculate what would be the probability of being a cancer patient who smoked one to four cigarettes. It would be the probability of smoking one to four cigarettes times the probability of being a cancer patient. Right? That would be the probability of being a cancer patient who smoked one to four cigarettes. If cancer has nothing to do with how many cigarettes you smoke, if these events are truly independent, that would be the case. And then how many people would you expect to see who smoked one to four cigarettes and had cancer? You would expect it to be the probability of being a cancer patient who smoked one to four cigarettes times your total number of observations, which is 1,269. Let me say that again. So the probability of being in the first row, i.e. smoking one cigarette, is 88 over 1269. The probability of being in the first column, i.e. being a cancer patient, is 647 over 1269. So the probability of being in the first row in the first column, that is being a cancer patient who smokes one to four cigarettes, is just the product of these two numbers. So how many people out of 1269 do you expect to find? You expect to find the probability of being one smoking one to four cigarettes times the probability of being a cancer patient, oops, times how many cases you have. So you'd expect 88 over 1269 times 647 over 1269 times 1269, which is 44.86, or about 45. But notice it's not an integer, but you would expect 44.86. What did we have? Oops. In fact, we had 33. So we'd expect 45 over there instead of 33. So if there was no connection, we'd expect 45. So in terms of calculating chi-squared, the first thing we'd have to do is take this 44.86, subtract 33, right, and uh, take the square, and then divide by um, the expected value, which is 44.86. So you'd, 40, you'd have 50, roughly 50, uh, 12 squared divided by 45. We'd have to do this 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 10 times. That would be painful. But that's the idea. That's what you'd be doing. You'd do that, make that calculation 10 times. R to the rescue. This is exactly what something like R is wonderful for. And in fact, the base package of R calculates this for you. It not only calculates this for you, it calculates the um, the p square, the p chi square value. So the function is called the Pearson's chi square test, and it's chi square dot test. All you have to give it is cancer, and what's this number for? Ah, remember chi square test depends on your data, and it depends on how many degrees of freedom you have. The degrees of freedom is the number of rows minus one times the number of columns minus one. In this case, there were two rows, two minus one is one, and there were five columns. Five minus one is four. So one times four is four. So you'd want to perform the chi-squared test for whatever with four degrees of freedom. And this function will calculate A, what the chi-squared value is, and B, as a bonus, it calculates the probability of getting a value of that big or greater. So when you perform this test, it gives you this output. It says this x stands for chi squared. And chi is the Greek x. So you would actually get the number 36.953. And if you ask your quell, so here it says four degrees of freedom. And if you ask yourself, what is the probability of getting 36.953? 
a chi-squared value of 36.953, given that the data, there is no connection between cancer and non-cancer, you would get the probability of that is six zeros and divided by one. So it's one to the 100,000th, the one to the one millionth, some very, very small number. So that means the probability that you would observe that table, given that there was no connection that smoking and getting cancer was independent, is essentially zero. So we've calculated the zero. So it says the, the, the upshot of this is that the probability that the cancer is unconnected to smoking is essentially zero. Now, that proves cancer is connecting. It's connected to, uh, to smoking. It doesn't prove smoking causes cancer. Uh, the other thing I want to point out is R tends not to just spit out answers. It tends to create objects. So if we said instead of just asking for the value of chi-squared tests on cancer, we just create a chi-squared test. Oops, excuse me. We can create an object. It'll show us that, but we, this object has a structure and a summary. And we see this is a summary, and perhaps more interesting, the structure is it's, it's a list of nine things. It has the statistics. It has the p-value. It has the method. It has the data name. It has the observations. And here's some interesting information. It gives us the expected value. So I'm just going to point out that 44.9, remember we calculated about 45, I think 44.8 something, so to one decimal, 44.9 is what we calculated. It calculates what you'd expect, and it calculates the residuals, which is the differences of what you observe from what you expect. So it gives you a lot more information in case you needed it. So for example, if I want to see what the residuals are, cancer data on dollar sign residuals. And remember, dollar sign is an R, the standard way of uh, getting at the piece of an object. So if the structure of cancer data is, you know, has these nine things, you, you would find out, you would give, get it for yourself by saying dollar sign. So cancer data dollar sign p dot value would give you that number. And um, I just, to give you an example, I, cancer data dollar sign residuals shows you how more, much more or less you, you get. So you see in the high cigarette groups, in the people who do have cancer, you're having positive values, which is saying that you're observing more cancer than you expect. And you have negative values in the control group. You get, you're observing far more, less cancer than you'd expect, given that there's no connection between cancer smoking and cigarettes. So what to make of the fact that smoking small numbers of cigarettes seems to prevent cancer? Um, the main thing to take away is that the Pearson chi-square test is unreliable when there are small numbers of data points. There is something called Fisher's exact test, which can be used if you have a small number of data and you have exact contingency tables. It basically is uh, for two by two tables, which is, you know, heads, tails for two coins kind of a thing. In that kind of a situation, you, you can actually, by doing some algebra and probability theory, come up with exact values without having to go through the chi-squared thing. Um, and I will, I just over here created uh, two things, I just smokers, non-smokers. So this is a two by two table. And uh, I just went through it. I can do the chi-squared test. And then I could also do the Fisher test. Now the one thing, uh, point worth pointing out is the Fisher test will give you more information. This is a function of the fact that because the Fisher test is calculated in a different way. Uh, in essence, you can, that binomial theorem that I showed you in the first or second slide can be used to um, <clears throat> get exact values. So it gives you a p-value. It's the probability that um, the non-smokers and the smokers uh, only two out of uh, 29 people who didn't smoke got cancer, and 600, almost half the people, more than half the people who did smoke had cancer in terms of sick. You know, it says it's highly unlikely. It gives you a p-value of, uh, again, essentially zero, that you could draw from the same distribution and get 2 over 27 and 647 over 622. So it says it's highly likely the probabilities are different 
for smokers and non-smokers of getting cancer. It's essentially the zero probability that the, the same odds. And the other thing it does is it gives you what's a 95% confidence interval. It's, this is saying that basically uh, you'd expect that it, uh, the true ratio to be between, between zero and 28% from one to the other. Okay, some takeaway points. This computes the probability of observing the odds ratio given that its real ratio is one. We observe a 7% probability in the first case. Uh, the 95% confidence interval is a 95% confidence interval for the true odds ratio. So the true odds ratio doesn't include one, you reject it. All right, I, you can look at these at your leisure. I just give you some more examples of using Fisher test. Um, I, I ended the lecture with this. I do want to say one more thing after this, but uh, we, we're now in a position to really, statistic, on a statistically sound basis, answer the question, if I flip a coin 100 times and get 80 heads, what are the chances it's fair? We can use either the Fisher test or the um, Pearson. We can use Fisher because we have a two by two table. So this top piece of code, it just creates a two by two matrix encoding the information. My first coin has 50 heads and 50 tails, it's the fair coin. And my second coin has 80 heads and 20 tails. And my null hypothesis is that these are drawn from the same distribution, i.e. even though 80, 20 came out, it's still probable that the coin is fair. There's still more than a 5% chance that the coin is fair. Is that or not? Fisher test, p-value, four zeros and a one, okay? So about a one in 10,000 chance, I believe if I got my decimal places right, essentially zero, certainly far less than 5%. The probability is very close to zero that this coin is uh, fair. And we accept the alternative hypothesis that the true odds ratio was not one, which is to say the coin that, that showed 80-20 was not a fair coin. So what are the odds? Very small, we reject the hypothesis the coin is fair. Now again, just to keep in mind, this doesn't prove the coin isn't fair. We saw at the beginning of this talk that there was some positive probability, i.e. small, but there was some positive probability you could do it. But we are not going to believe that's the case. We are going to accept the hypothesis the coin, or reject the hypothesis the coin is fair and say the data suggests that the alternative hypothesis the coin isn't fair is correct. This is where I ended the last lecture. I want to go back and um, talk about one more example of hypothesis testing and sort of put together what we did last week and this week. So last week um, we were talking about hypothesis testing and we were doing various sorts of um, sampling techniques to say if we observed a certain mean in our sample, was it likely that the true mean of the sample was something? Now. For this, I'm, I'm, I want to use a different data set. This is the wine quality data set that's um, on the um, Irvine, California University um, machine learning databases. And I just want to point out, I had it stored locally and I could get it with this, but as I pointed out at the beginning, you can use read.csv to go out to the web and uh, get data sets. So if you look, you would discover that it was in this directory and that the name was winequality-red.csv. So if I say read.csv uh, and give it this web address <coughs> and header is true and remember the separator we saw by inspection is a semicolon, you, would, you could download the set and you can download this data onto your own machine using this command. And the identical command says, are these two objects the same? Identical of wine and wine two, same data set, shows that in fact, this method works. Okay, if we look at wine, it, it, it gives a bunch of, uh, I think there's 14 variables. Important one is quality. So this is the rating. So this is an integer, it turns out these wines, wines were rated between uh, three and eight. So they got a score of three and eight. And then we had alcohol which ran between a minimum of 8.4 and a maximum of almost 15% and an average value of 10.4. And the question I want to ask is, does alcohol affect wine quality? Right? So we um, 
so that the quality of the mean is 5.6 and the average alcohol is 10.4. So one simple thing we could do, and we're going to discuss correlation in much greater detail, but we could just look at correlation and it comes up with 0.47, which suggests it, but that's, you'd want better evidence to make such a statement. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to look at um, the alcohol and the wine quality. Right? So I'm just going to pull out those two columns. And remember, the um, mean of the alcohol was 10.4. So we're going to call wine heavy alcohol if its wine content was greater than 0.4. Remember, which will give us an index of which rows of wine alcohol were greater than 10.4. So if I call heavy wine, um, wine of heavy index comma, this is going to give me all the rows for which the mean of, for which the alcohol was 10.4 was bigger than 10.4 and then wine of minus heavy index minus just says everything except those rows so this is going to give me all the rows for which uh, the wine uh, of wine for which the um, for which the alcohol was less than or equal to 10.4 percent and finally I say what's the mean of heavy wine quality well the mean is 6.02 and the mean of white wine is 5.34. And remember, the mean of the whole sample uh, was 10.4 and 5.6. So we see that the, the average score for the wines with more alcohol was higher. So it's heavier than alcohol wines have a higher score. But is, is this just luck? Is this just damn random luck? Or, or is this significant? So I'm gonna, we did the book showed a method to do it and we did an example of this. I wanna introduce a different technique which is called bootstrapping. And what bootstrapping is, is you repeat, you pretend you keep drawing new samples from your data set and act as if they're independent. Uh, in essence, the law of large numbers guarantees that in the long run, this is gonna work. So you have to do this a bunch of times. So what you're going to do is sample with replacement from the heavy wine data set. What does that mean? It means I'm going to take a sample. I, I don't remember. We'll find out. Well, let's see. There were 683 wines that had heavy alcohol. I'm going to take a sample of 500 of them with replacement. That's not critical, but it's typical. It allows you to do uh, get better sampling when you don't have that many samples to start with. And for each one of these samples, I'm going to calculate the average wine quality. I'm going to get the mean of the wine quality. All right? I'm going to compare that. Now, what you'd expect is if, in fact, it was just statistical luck that the heavy wines had a higher average quality than the overall wines, you'd expect if you did this resampling, you would get, on average, average wine qualities that are the same or close to what the average wine quality is. So we calculate, we saw 6.0 something, we saw that for the whole set is 5.6. If the hypothesis is that heavy wines have the same quality rating as uh, all wines, if this is true, by doing this sort of sampling, we'd expect to get that 5.6 was very near the average value of what we got. It was just bad luck that we hit on the whole set. And this can be made statistically precise. This is a, a concept due to Brad Efron, uh, a wonderful statistician. So what did I do? First thing I did was I set seed for reproducibility. When I set dot seed 17, this means that at least in my machine, whenever I do this random calculation of randomly sampling, I'm going to randomly get the same random sample. So I'm going to do it a thousand times. So I'm going to calculate, I'm going to pick a sample and calculate its average quality a thousand times. So for I in one to a thousand, my index is going to sample from one to 683. Remember there was 683 rows, 500 times. And I'm going to allow sampling with replace. Replace equals false. No, in this case I didn't. So I just take 500. And then in the i spot, I'm going to put the mean of what the quality was for that sample of 500. And then when it's done, which takes a split second, 
I will have a bunch of different estimates for the mean, not just that one of 6.04, and here they are. And we can see they're grouped very close to 6%. There's a few, just a few that are higher than 6.08, and just a few that are less than 5.98. So this histogram looks daunting for the hypothesis. And uh, so how many of them actually had um, a value of 5.34 or less, which is the value that we got for the overall line set? None of them. So in fact, we can see that on average, we got 6.02, okay? 50% of the data is between the first and third quartile. 50% of the time, we got a sample mean of between 6.01 and 6.04, right? <laughs> That's some pretty strong evidence. So what this testing says is you would absolutely reject the hypothesis that wine alcohol is unrelated to wine quality. You would completely reject it. The evidence is overwhelming that the observed difference in wine quality between the wines that have heavy alcohol and the wines that are randomly chosen, that just is not random. Wines with more alcohol have higher quality. Now, you know, let's go to R. We've just spent a whole lot of time in this past week uh, with the chi-squared distribution. And I feel I'd be remiss if I didn't point out you could provide the same analysis, okay, to um, of computing a chi value. So I just read the data in. Remember, this is an R script. So I can just, if I hit control enter, I will do that. Now, table is another very useful function. Table calculates counts. So let me just, I think it's simplest to just illustrate this. You see? I get a table which says, all right, if they got a quality of three, one of them had 8%, one of them had 9%, five had 10%. If they got a quality of seven, only two of them had 9%, 35 had 10 58 had 11, 81 had 12, 18 had 13% uh, alcohol. So this is a table. Uh, but what I want to do is just look at wines which have high alcohol versus not. So I'm going to, again, I just want to create uh, a counter for whether wine has high alcohol. So I create a matrix of zeros, number of rows, the length of wine. So for each uh, row, I'm adding a new column called high alcohol. And then for the ones that are of high alcohol or alcohol greater than the mean, I'm making the value one. So high alcohol of heavy index is one. Remember, it, it started out with everything equal to zero. And by this command, I say, if you're on one of the rows that corresponds to a, a wine with more alcohol than average, make the high alcohol index one. And then I'm saying wine, I'm adding this column wine alcohol to the to my data frame. And I could execute all this code again if I want by highlighting it and just sitting run. And the last thing you see, now you see there's a new column called high alcohol. And now wine chi is uh, just 12 and 13, which is quality and high alcohol. And we can again get the table. Uh, let me, now we see, uh, if it got a quality rating of three, seven of them got, were low alcohol, three were high, got a quality rating of four, 34 were low alcohol, 19 were high, keep going, got a quality rating of six, 325, low alcohol, 310 were um, high alcohol. It, it's pretty clear that we're going where this story is headed. A quality level of seven, only 37 of them were low alcohol, 162 were high alcohol. So what you want to ask is, is the qual so the no hypothesis in this case would be, is the quality of wine independent of the alcohol content? And we've got the two counts. We have the counts of wines that have low alcohol and the counts of wine have, who have high alcohol. Maybe we should call this um, the control group and this group we could call cirrhosis of the liver. Uh, but in any event, it's the same sort of table. 
and we want to see if we what's the probability of getting a count that looks like this given that there is no connection between alcohol and quality and remember here you got alcohol and here you have quality so you, you have counts of wines with low alcohol and counts of wines with high alcohol and you want to say what's the probability now we use the chi-square test remember we have, we have to give it uh, the data which is wine chi the other thing we have to give it is the degrees of freedom. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six columns. So six minus one is five and two rows. Two minus one is five. So there are five degrees of freedom. If I run that line, <laughs> uh, it's just saying basically it's so small. So we get a very large chi value. And it says the probability of getting a value that big or larger is less than 2.2 to the minus 16 and it's so small that's why it's giving you this warning the chi-squared approximation may be incorrect but since we're going to take this to mean zero so what does that mean again the hypothesis was that wine uh, quality is independent of the alcohol content right? and we said what's the probability of finding of seeing this table if that's true we measure this by saying, well, we know what we'd expect. You know, we'd expect if they were independent of each other, we could, we could, we could find the on average table. Right? That was the expected value, and then we can, you know, find this chi squared value, which is the difference between what we expect under the hypothesis and what we observe. And the difference this chi squared is 353. And given five degrees of freedom. There's essentially zero probability of getting a chi-squared value of 353. So we reject the hypothesis that there is uh, no connection between wine quality and alcohol. And the alternative hypothesis is that wine quality is related to alcohol. Uh, for those of you who like to drink, I suppose you might say this is uh, good news. Uh, for those of you who don't like to drink, I suppose uh, the, the, only, the, the good news in this is that um, this data is for uh, Portuguese red wines from one specific year, and you could argue that maybe in other wines that's less true. All right, um, that's really all I want to say. And I'll talk to you soon.